space. Ladies and gentlemen, Rebecca Douglas. Hello. So I'm going to talk to you about detecting gravitational waves or searching for wobbles in space because that's all a gravitational wave is. It's just a space wobble. And space wobbles were first predicted by Albert Einstein and his general theory of relativity. Einstein said that heavy things curved space, heavy things like stars. Now, if heavy things can curve space, then exciting, violent, catastrophic events like supernova explosions or colliding black holes, they can have the effect of churning space up. They create shock waves in the fabric of space itself, making ripples and wobbles and what we call gravitational waves. Now, they're very small, but they travel a long way, so we should be able to detect them here on Earth. But that theory is very nearly 100 years old now, and so far, nobody's managed it. Actually, that's quite a good thing because it keeps me in a job. Um, and part of my job is improving the detectors that try to measure these things. Our detectors, thank you, Microsoft Paint. Our detectors are basically a laser pointing at a mirror. A little bit more complicated than that. It's actually a laser pointing at two mirrors. This guy in the middle, imaginatively named, this is the beam splitter. It splits the beam. So half of the light goes up to one mirror, and half goes across to the other. It gets reflected back into the middle, where it makes a pattern. Then, if a gravitational wave comes past, it wobbles the mirrors, the pattern moves, we detect the wave, everyone gets a Nobel Prize, and we all live happily ever after. Or oh, that's the theory. And that would work if not for one tiny detail. Other things can wobble mirrors. Um, it's slightly awkward, actually. And so we spend a lot of time trying to make sure they don't. And any, th any time anything other than a gravitational wave wobbles a mirror, we call that noise. Noise is kind of like when you're tuning your radio and um, well, you're, tw you're twiddling the knob. And as you twiddle the knob, this is my knob twiddling hand, as you twiddle the knob, the radio goes kshh. And every now and again, you get a blip of music or talk or whatever it is you want to hear. So you know that if you continue to twiddle the knob, eventually, you will tune out all of the hiss, all the noise, and you will only be left with your music, your signal. It's sort of like that except that we try to listen to every single frequency at once, and so far, we haven't heard a signal. But we're working on it, and what we want to do is turn the volume down on the noise so that we can hear our signal above it. For us, we have two major noise sources, heavy things moving around and fidgeting atoms. Heavy things are a problem because of the nature of gravity itself. Anything with mass is attracted to anything else with mass. I am deeply attracted to everybody in this audience tonight. And uh, you, you are all attracted to me as well. There's, there's no getting out of that. That's, that's science. That's true. Um, and similarly, if I drop an apple, it lands on the ground because it's attracted to the Earth. The Earth is attracted to the apple as well. It moves a little bit too. Not as much, but it does. And so our mirrors are suspended from the ceiling. And they're a little free to move. So if something heavy moves past them, they'll swing towards it. And when it goes away, they'll swing back to the middle. So we've got this wobble without a wave. We've got noise. We've got a problem. And we're worried about things the size of clouds or cars or people. And since you can't get rid of people, no matter how much you might like to, you have to do something else. One thing you might want to do is go to space. Space is great. No people in space. Brilliant idea. The problem with that is that space missions are expensive, and they take a really long time to get ready. We expect to have a space mission working in about 15 years. You should know when a scientist tells you something will happen in 15 years that they are lying to you. They mean more than 15 years. So if you want to detect a signal before then, you might do something else. Another good idea is to go underground. It just so happens that there is already a physics facility underground in an old disused mine in Japan. That's great. Even better, it's under a mountain. And that means that if there is stuff wandering around outside, it doesn't matter because there's a great big mountain in the way and that has the effect of muffling the noise. So you might hear your signal above it. But it's not enough to simply put your detector underground. And that's because of the other problem, the fidgeting atoms. All things are made out of atoms and all atoms fidget. There is nothing you can do about that. If ever you are told off for fidgeting, you should say, well, 
I am very sorry, but I am made out of atoms. And if I stopped fidgeting, I would violate the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. <laughs> Best case scenario, you'll start a debate about whether or not quantum theory can be used to describe something the size of a person. Worst case scenario, they won't ever speak to you again. Either way, fidgeting atoms are no longer your problem, but they are still my problem. Because if the atoms in my mirror fidget, my mirror will move and I will get noise. So we want to stop them from fidgeting as much as we can. Now we know that if you make things hot, the atoms fidget more. That's why things melt and evaporate and boil. So logically, we need to cool things down instead. And that's where I come in, because I'm cool. We're going to cool our detectors down with liquid nitrogen and liquid helium. But no one's ever done this before. No one's ever put a detector under a mountain and cooled it down this way. So we have a few things to work out first. First of all, we realize that we can't use glass anymore. Up until now, we've always used beautiful, ultra-pure glass for our detectors. But when you cool glass down, it does funny stuff. The atoms fidget in ways we can't cope with. So we have to use something else. And we've decided to use sapphire. Sapphire does not look like that in the lab. That would be far too exciting. We wouldn't get any work done. Sapphire looks like that in the lab. That's my thumb. And so it's, it's not blue, actually, because the blueness in sapphire is impurity. And we need our mirrors as pure as possible. So I work with bits of sapphire like that almost every day. And they were the two major things so far we wanted to know. First of all, our mirrors are suspended from the ceiling. The fibers they're suspended from are made out of sapphire as well. Is it going to be strong enough, or is it going to snap and drop our really expensive sapphire gem on the ground and smash it in a million pieces? That would be an expensive mistake. And so I take bits of sapphire, I put them in liquid nitrogen, and I break them. I break a lot of sapphire on purpose. And it's fantastic fun. Another thing we're worried about is we have our mirror over here cooled down with liquid nitrogen, liquid helium, which isn't cheap to do. And we've got a laser over here, and we're going to shine the laser at it. Lasers make things hot. Even James Bond knew he had to be afraid of getting burned by lasers. And so if this is going to work and it's not all going to be a waste, we have to find a way to get the heat out we're going to send it out through the fibers. Will it work? We don't know. So I take bits of sapphire, I put them in liquid nitrogen, I heat up one end, and I see if the other end gets hot. They're going to give me a PhD for this. I can't believe my luck. There are one or two other things to finish before I can write a thesis. But with all of this time and money, and sapphire certainly is expensive, you might well be wondering why we should bother at all. And the reason is we don't really understand space. Oh, we've put men on the moon. We have, by the way, we have put men on the moon. We've put probes on Mars and sent them out to the far reaches of the solar system and beyond. That's something to be proud of. But it doesn't mean that we understand space. That would be like me getting the train down from Glasgow like I did this morning and then claiming to be a well-seasoned traveler. It's not quite true. It doesn't represent the whole truth. And the problem is we can't go to space to do experiments. No one can do an experiment on a star. So we have to sit back and watch what happens. And up until now, we've only been watching with light, because that's all we've got. But light doesn't shine on everything. Light doesn't shine on black holes. More than 60% of the universe is supposed to be made up of this dark matter stuff. We don't even really know what that is. You can be sure light doesn't shine on it. When a massive star explodes in a supernova explosion, there's too much light to see the detail in the center. It would be like trying to see the filament of a bulb by switching the bulb on. You'd get dazzled, it won't work. But all of these things are heavy. All of these things work with gravity. And so all of them produce some sort of gravitational wave, some sort of space wobble that we should be able to measure. And if we learn to do that, we'll see something no one has ever seen before. We'll see something completely new. And we'll open a new window on our universe. Douglas Adams said, space is big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you might think it's a long way down the road for chemists, but that's just peanuts to space. With a universe so huge and so confusing, mankind will probably never understand it all. But wouldn't it be a shame not to try? Thank you very much.